Mr. Nylinger, what's for breakfast? Dude apples, bacon, and biscuits. Well, forget the apples. Slap some bacon on a biscuit and let's go. We're burning daylight. Burning daylight? Oh, I see a star. You can see a lot more. I'm going to get a move. Be ready for that. I want you to turn, if you could, in the Bible to um, the scripture that we've been looking at in this series. Powerful thing, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 2. And I told you last week that I was through with this series, but God had different plans. And so you get one more message. But the scripture says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, give you a chance to, to turn there. And this is the way Jesus started out a lot of his messages. And he's, he's saying, okay, guys, we're burning daylight. It's time to go. It's time to move. It's time to make a decision. It's time to make a choice. It's time to take some steps. You're wasting time. It's time. And he says, repent. And it is time. There's something that, that you need to repent over. Mate, you, everybody thinks that when you say repent, it's somebody better than you coming to tell you how bad you are. And that's not what it is. It's, repent is one of the most awesome words in the whole Bible. I, it is the most refreshing thing that has ever happened to me in my life is when I come to a point where I change my mind in the wrong direction I'm going or the wrong decision I've made, a change of mind, change of heart, change of direction. He says, hey, wake up, turn around. Do something different. Step the right way. Stop stepping the wrong way. Repent for the kingdom. And we've talked about this. Is so many times the problem in our lives and what we probably number one need to repent of is that we're king of our own kingdoms. And I'm, it's not going to work for you. And you think it is, but it hasn't worked yet. And there's an emptiness, emptiness in your gut and you're struggle and stressed out. Because you're trying to be the king of your own kingdom. He says, hey, why don't you try letting me be the king of your kingdom? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's easier to do, closer to you to do than you think. And so God's trying to reshape our mind. This message today, I, I, I honestly, the Lord gave it to me. And I thought, um, I thought, okay, this is not that important. I'm just being honest with you. I said, okay, I've got four great messages you've given me here, and, and this is not going to really relate to a lot of people. And I'm telling you what, man, the Lord turned me around, and I had to repent. <laughs> and and, and I, had an, I had something else in mind, and this is a big deal. And I was just so convicted and challenged by the Lord that he wants this to be said and he, God, God wants us to do something here that is a powerful thing. There is a step that I'm encouraging you to take. It is a real hard, it was the, I, I really believe it was the hardest step I've ever taken in my life. And I didn't think it related to you the way it related to me. But I really do think it does relate to you. I know it does. This step I'm fixing to tell you is more than likely the number one thing that almost caused me to go to hell. And if you've been around here, you know my life. You know the struggles and the wrecks that I've been through. And I should be in hell 14 times over. But God had a plan. But th what I'm going to talk about today is the one thing that just about caused me to go to hell. And what it was, was church. Church embarrassed me. Church made me feel stupid. Because... They asked me to go to church, and my mama stuck a Bible in my hand and forced me to go to a Sunday school class. Now, what Sunday school meant for me was they're going to humiliate me and embarrass me and ask me to read in front of a bunch of people, going to make me hold hands with somebody, and going to make me ask me to pray in front of a bunch of people. And I'm telling you what. I'd rather jumped in a den of rattlesnakes as I had to go to Sunday school. And it never quit. So I'd not take my Bible, 
and they'd hand me a Bible and make me humiliate. I can't read very well. You hear me read? You, you think I can't read good as you right now? Why don't you? You know, I'm the guy like Moses says, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And so I grew up literally the most embarrassing thing that I've ever done in my life is go to church. And so as a result, I didn't want anything to do with God. And so uh, when I was nine years old, I made a decision to get saved like you're supposed to do in church and get baptized. The only problem was I did it up here and I didn't do it right here. How many of y'all know there's a big difference in church up here and Jesus right here? And so I didn't really truly give my life to Jesus until I was 29 years old. And so after that, as soon as I was old enough, I just took a path following Satan down the wrong road. Why? Because I hated church. Because church made me look stupid. Church embarrassed me. That's my story. And I'm convinced that some of you are not taking the next step because you're worried about what somebody else thinks about you too. You're worried about Somebody's going to make you stupid if you look stupid if you go to a small group or somebody's going to ask you to read. And you're worried about not knowing where a book in the Bible is when they turn, say, turn to a book. And you're worried about you, you, you just came to know the Lord. And you weren't like all these other people, so you think. I don't know if you know this, but about 85% of our church weren't raised in church. Okay? And you think everybody around here knows a lot about the Bible, and that's not the case. That's actually the only reason I can be your pastor, because I'm not as smart as most other pastors. So, <laughs> just being honest. That's also why you understand me. <laughs> so, what I used to think was a bad thing, I realized was a gift from God. Because <laughs> if I talked like other pastors, you wouldn't be here. Hey, we wouldn't have this church. So, thank you, Lord. So, this, uh, this thing I'm talking about, this one step that I'm leading up to, doesn't seem like a whole lot, but it is a lot. And it was a huge thing for me, and I'm convinced that it is a huge thing for many people here. And it is this, and this is what almost cost me heaven, and it's because I wouldn't come together. And, I, and here's the, the title of the message is called Together. And that's the step. You say, well, that don't sound like much. Oh, it is a lot. It's a lot. And it's time. You're burning daylight. It's time to come together. It's time for you to take some next steps. I want you to look in the Bible to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 and 23. I want you to circle this in your Bible. It's, I want you to find this scripture. This is something you need to hang on to. You need to write it down in your notes or put it on your phone or whatever it may be. And, but this, uh, you know, this thing together is real important. We're talking about Will Anderson and the Cowboys. And as tough and big and bad as John Wayne is, and as Will Anderson, he was not a loner. He was a together. And he realized he was not going to get the job done and by himself. And so Will Anderson took some steps to bring this together together. And with young people, people that weren't as good as he was, was and he wasn't, he wasn't critical of them. He helped them learn a job and move forward in life. And so they had never done that before. But if he hadn't stepped down on their level and helped the together thing happen, then he'd have never got the cattle from the double O to Belfouche. And so this, the story of this it makes so much sense in our life. And so we have got to understand also that there's something about the body of Christ being a Christian comes that together is your next step. Together is your next step. Why? Because if you're like me, and you stay alone, You can go through your whole life being alone. But you won't be alone when you get to hell. 
Hell's going to be full of a bunch of loners in church because they never step together. Okay? So check it out. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It says, Let us hold unswerving to the hope that we profess, the hope of Jesus Christ, the future that we have together. And it says, For, for he who promised is faithful. It says, Let us consider how to... How, to, how, how we may spur one another on towards love and good. That hope is our future, and we're to plan how to help each other, spur one another on. That's what this series is called, Burning Daylight. Every last one of us got something that God wants us to do, and our lives have gotten complicated. Your job, your family, your finances, our health, or our debt, or whatever it is, and things have gotten complicated, and you're not living the life God called you to live. You're not doing the things he's called you to do, and there is emptiness, and there's unhappiness in your life, and you're stuck in the middle the intersection i'm coming up behind you going beep beep let's go we're burning daylight and i'm encouraging let's move stop it repent go forward and keep looking at the next verse it says not giving up meeting what's the word say there can you say that out real loud together not giving up to go camping, not giving up to sleep in, not giving up to go take your kids fishing, not giving up to go. It's deer season's rolling around. Everybody's got to have a little vacation in deer sand. Can I get a good amen from you men folk? But deer hunting can become your God. It says not giving up. I'm going to say not very much. Okay, plan it out. Not very much. Not giving up meeting together as some have Got in the habit of doing, but encourage one another. So, hey, guys, don't do that. If your ball tournaments and your kids are taking you away from God, is that a healthy thing for your family? If your job is taking you, I know you got to do what you got to do, but there may be another opportunity for you to get another job where you don't have to sacrifice God and your family for a little bit of money. I don't know what it is, but we got all got opportunities to step towards God. Things that are causing us to stop coming together. We don't have time because we got two handfuls of life. It's not giving up meeting together as some have gotten in the habit of doing. You can, how many of y'all know you can get in a habit? It's real easy. You miss one Sunday, you miss two Sundays. You don't go to a small group, you don't go to a small group this semester, you don't go to a small group the next semester. You don't come together, you just keep pushing back, being a loner. He says, but encourage one another all the more as the days are approaching. So God has this design. He has a design for all of us. And it's in one word, together, together. That's the next step. And that was the step that I didn't want to take, that I couldn't take, uh, because in church was the thing that I hated the most because it embarrassed me. It made me look stupid. And so Satan once he had me okay he knew the gift that God gave me of being reading slow enough where everybody could understand I thought it was a curse <laughs> but it was a gift and he knew that he, if he could use my weaknesses on this earth to get me apart from God that he could create me to be a loner and he did and here's a quote that I, I wrote down. It says, until you get over being a loner, you will not be an overcomer. You see that? Until you get over being a loner, you're never going to become an overcomer. Never going to become an overcomer. But together is hard. It was very hard for me. Together was not easy. Um, you know, a, lot, a lot of times people uh, are the problem. And you, you don't trust other people. And you don't want to come together because maybe you've been hurt. In America right now, we have more social media going on, and we're communicating. Uh, young, young people got their phones up there right now, and I know they're looking at the Bible, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Y'all, y'all got your phones down here, too. Y'all looking at the Bible, right? Yep, yeah, sitting nodding ahead, looking intelligent. You ain't texting nobody. You're looking at the Bible. It's a whole lot easier to find books in the Bible on your phone. Can I get a good Amen. You know, you don't have to turn in pages. You know, I like my Bible. I take, go to small group. I take my Bible. But that's just me. But, you know, America's communicating on our cell phones and our handheld devices now more than ever. And, and the uh, poll said that teenagers, uh, on average, have over 300. On average, is 300 Instagram followers. But when asked teenagers how many real 
friends that they had, the average was one. Teenagers said 25% of them said that, n that they had zero real friends. We got all this communication going on, social media, and we'll say things behind the skirt of a screen, but we don't have any real friends. And so it's a real problem, especially when that's the plan that God has for the church to move forward. Acts chapter 5, verse 8, if you look at that, I'm sorry, not Acts, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it may be a familiar verse for you, but it talks about Satan and his nature and how he likes to work as, and get loners. He says, be uh, alert. The, and be sober mind, have a sober mind of your enemy. He says, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so that's Satan's plan for your life. And so you think about a lion crouched down in a thicket and trying to get him a meal and something to eat and devour. You know, a lion is big, stout, strong, but he can't get a whole herd. What does he do? He gets the loners he separates out. If they're in a herd, he'll try to separate them out of the herd and get them over here all by themselves. And, and, and if, uh, if they're off by themselves, it's just easy, easy prey. And that's what Satan tries to do to each one of you. That's what he's trying to do to your husband right now. That's why he's not here right now because Satan's trying to get him to be a loner. That's why your wife is not here with you right now because Satan's trying to get her to be a loner. That's why your teenagers didn't want to come to church. He's already trying to get them to be loners. That's why your best friend has gotten a little... He's never going to stop. Church that works is together. Satan's plan is a loner. Loners are never going to become overcomers. Uh, I asked David if I could share his story and, and uh, I just am so proud of him. I'm so proud of many of you but this one is just one I had to, had to share. David Wooten is a, is a guy that I've related to for a long time, and we got a lot in common. We both like to hunt and fish, and, and, our, and our kids are connected, and it's just, it, we've we just always been connected. But David was one of those guys that just would come on Sunday mornings. And we started doing some, uh, small groups, and he, he didn't really want to do that. And, his, and Nikki finally got him to come to a small group. And the, one of the things they did, which is a no-no for our small groups, we don't ask anybody to read or ask anybody to pray or ask anybody any hard questions, okay? And I found out two small groups that did it last week, and I'm just telling you, I asked them to stop doing it, okay? So we're not going to go back to Sunday school. Y'all understand? We ain't going back. And here's why. David sat in a small group. He sat in a small group. Nikki finally got him to come, and they asked him to they, that somebody read in the small group. Now, they were organized, and I think they asked him to read in advance. But what did David think? Oh, my goodness. They're fixing to ask me to read in front of all these people. You know what? David never came back. Nikki never would, could get him to come back. Went through that whole semester, never came back again. The same small group I started leading. Jeremy House was trying to help me lead it. I started leading that small group. We were meeting up Big Jake's. Nikki's coming. David's not coming. And one day, I just asked Nikki. I had no idea. Nobody told me this, I promise you. But I said, Nikki, I've been asking her to try to get David to come. David wouldn't come. I'd call David, he wouldn't come. And it's just like, I don't know why, but I said, is he not coming in a small group because he's worried somebody's going to ask him to read? And her mouth fell open. And she looked at me like, how did you know that? I said, I didn't. I just said, it's a, it happened to me, and sometimes I'm sensitive to when it could happen to somebody else. I said, would you please tell him, invite him again, and tell him, promise him, I'm not going to ask him to read, and I'm not going to ask him to pray. I just want him to come spend some time, and let's grow together and get to know each other. Guess who showed up the next week? David Wooten. David Wooten. He never missed another small group. Guess what happened then? Yeah. Yeah, amen. But that's not the end of the story. 
The next semester comes around, and him and Nikki offer to host the small group. We move from restaurants to their house. Me and Ryan are leading the small group. One, we, we're rotating, and, and David is, never has to do anything. He's just, you know, there helping and encouraging people, inviting people to his house. He's hosting, him and Nick, you're hosting a small group. He gives great input and great help. One time, me and Ryan couldn't be there. <laughs> and I was like, what are we going to do? And David said, I can take care of it. I'm like, oh, my goodness. This is a guy that I said I'm never going to ask to read, never going to ask any hard questions, and the Lord's growing in him. Some, there's a lot of y'all here right now because of David Wooten. And then you know what? Another semester rolls around, and guess who's the co-host of David and Nikki's small group? Me. That means I'm in the background. You know what? I've only led one small group so far, and David Wooten has led every one of them. But there's people in, they had 24 people in his small group last Thursday night in Genoa. You know why? Because he's not intimidating those men. Know why? Those men understand the way he talks, and they relate to David. And David's growing like crazy. He works all day long listening to the Bible on a track hole, and he learns the Bible. He knows a whole lot more Bible than you do because he listens to it every day, all day long. Together. I got past taking the step together. David got past taking the step together. And sir and ma'am, young person, that's your next step. I see a lot of you doing it. It's amazing. But that is a step that's, that can keep you and cause you from going. All right, three, three different things that together does for us I want to share with you. Uh, together, we connect. Together we connect. Uh, it's, it's never good to be alone. And ne together we connect. Why is this so important? Because you need somebody to help you through life. And you say, well, I don't want somebody to help you through life. And that can, leaves you as a loner, leaves you as out there. Satan's going to get you and Satan is after you and you have no protection around you. First Corinthians, uh, well, let's look at this. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, it says, yes, and whatever a person is like. Paul said, hey, I'm trying to get common ground. He said to the weak, I become weak, the strong, I become strong, and so forth. He said, I'm trying to find common ground. He says, but I try to find common ground with him so that for a reason, for a purpose, that he will let me tell him about Christ. You know, me and David had common ground, hunting and fishing and some equipment and stuff like that. And so we, we found that common ground, and it was the link. And in our small groups, it's a place where you can find some common ground. It's so different when I go into David's living room and I see all them big old bucks on the wall over there. We start telling stories. It's, 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 it's great. You know, it's in a home or even in a restaurant. It's just a different feel, and it works. And so common ground. It's not to make you embarrassed, not to make you feel stupid. So why do we come together? Also, it's for protection. Again, Satan's going to devour those that get out by himself. But also, together, we protect. We protect each other. Prote together is hard. I understand that. Uh, believe me, I know. It is hard. But we protect each other. We help each other. When Satan's trying to attack our families, we gather around each other like a, like a, a, a pack of mama cows gathering around when coyotes are trying to get them baby calves. It hardly ever happens in a group of cows. It only happens when that mama maybe gets caught down in a thicket all by herself. If that calf is anywhere close to a group of cows and then coyotes come or wolves come or a cougar comes or whatever it may be trying to get that baby they gather up and they protect. And so the same thing happens with us. So this fall, I'm just encouraging you, your next step is to trust. Just trust me. 
This is for you. You need this. You need this. You, this fall, you need to try connecting with some people in a small group. Ecclesiastes 4 says two are better than one because they have no good, they have a good return for their labor. And if either of them falls down, the one can help the other one up. But I pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. You need somebody. Don't be like one of those teenagers that has only one real friend or maybe zero. The last one I'm going to give you is this, together we grow. Together we grow. You're, you, you're stuck. You don't, you're, you're not moving. Look at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Turn there and get that, circle that. Proverbs 27, verse 17. See, God's plan is together we grow. We help each other. As we look at the Word of God, we go through struggles in life. It all works together. It's pretty amazing. So what, what you can do uh, and, and what you can expect from a small group when you get in is you're going to expect to meet some friends. And you're going to expect to build some relationships. You can expect there to be a lot of eating. And probably by the end of the small group, you will be on Weight Watchers. <laughs> okay? Because they're potluck and everybody brings food. And I'm telling you, I, I always buy healthy rabbit food or something when I go. But somebody makes, last week, somebody made some apple I don't know what they was, fritters in one small group. And I have two small groups that I'm going to, and I visit all y'all's other small groups, and it never fails. Somebody's going to have some kind of peach cobbler in there, you know. And I, even though I don't bring in dessert, there's some kind of cake that I just got to have some of it. <laughs> so you will be on Weight Watchers at the end of the semester. <laughs> You can expect that. You can expect there to be a lot of slow turning of pages. And you can expect there to be a whole lot of questions. And you can expect some people to be in there that are quiet and don't want to say anything. And ain't nobody ever going to put any pressure on them. Usually, by the end of that small group, that person says something. And everybody goes, oh, they're saying something. And you realize there's a whole lot more in them than you ever realize. You can also expect the things that you think you're the only one going through. You're, you can expect to find somebody else or two other people or three other couples going through the same thing you're going through. It's kind of weird. <laughs> when you get together, you're not the only one going through that. And God will put you with people. You can expect that. You can expect a lot of people using their cell phones because it's hard to find the Bible pages in the Bible, you know, the books in the Bible because you can just push on whatever it is and boom, it just pops up. And so you can expect a lot of laughter. You can expect to build some trust and some relationships and people. And you can expect when you're going through something and if you say, would y'all pray for me, you can expect a lot of prayer. <laughs> you can expect some people that really care about what you're going through that week. You can expect some people to get back in touch with you and say, I'm just letting you know, you said that y'all were having this deal at work and this problem. I've been praying for you every day. You can expect the small group leader to pray for your name and your family every single day, seven days a week. Well, some things you can expect. So what's the scripture say? Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, show a friend sharpens a friend. And that's what's going to happen. You can expect God's word to be true. And every person, God has a plan and, and a potential, and you're not going to reach your potential until you together. It's your next step, until you together. Why? Because together we call out the best in each other, and it's just God's plan. Satan's plan, remind, I remind you, is loner, lone ranger. <laughs> that is Satan's plan. He does not like together because we come, become stronger together. I remember at Circle J Cowboy Church when we only had one small group. 
<laughs> and now we got many, we got them in three counties, and even our youth are doing small groups. They start doing small groups in the seventh grade, and now we have youth. We have people still in high school leading small groups for junior high students, the next generation down, that are studying the Word of God and are, are, are so bold now that they are helping younger generations than them take steps in their life. And it's a cool thing to see. As a result, uh, the majority of people that are moving forward and discovering their purpose, they're all in a small group. Pretty much the highest percentage of the people going through the growth track are in a small group because they've taken that step and they said, okay, I'm getting some things fixed up in my life and God has different plans for me. And next thing they realize is I want something more. And it's not just about me anymore. I'm getting that fixed. I'm getting some freedom here. And you start studying the Word, spiritually growing, and you start learning how to pray. And it's natural for you to want to go through the growth track. And so you go through the growth track, all these people, and then they start discovering their gift. Last week in one of the small groups, they are talking about this start. I'm in October, and I had four people talking about their gifts and how it made a difference in their life, and they were excited about it. And I guarantee you, Probably that whole small group is going to go to the growth tag in October. because Not because of what I said, because they see the difference. They see what's happening in other people's life when they discover their purpose. It's an amazing thing. But I do realize that not everybody's going to do together. Because I didn't. Okay. I'm going to just warn you. I think there's three reasons why people don't do together. The first reason is you don't know God yet. Until you come to know God, you don't want to do together. Now, you do together with your buddies that are doing the wrong stuff. There's, there's always together on that end. If you don't know God, you're more comfortable doing together with people that are running from God. But if you don't know God, you're not comfortable at all. And that's one reason why you're not going to do together. Another reason is you're like me, is you don't, you're afraid of being embarrassed. You're afraid somebody's going to make you look stupid. Because, and I'm just telling you, I can't get you over that. I know what it's like. Just, I'm, all I'm saying is trust me. I'm going to continue to make sure our small groups don't ask anybody to read. Unless everybody knows this person has, wants to read and is going to read. Now, you can go read any Bible you can do. And we, we talk about that and people start reading verses and that's great. But I can guarantee you nobody is going to ask you to read and put you on the spot or pray. If you're in one with a bunch of women, they'll probably ask you to hold their hands. That's okay. You, you get over it. You're going <laughs> to, I don't know. <laughs> Y'all lighten up. Together. Together. It's a good thing. But one of the reasons don't, is you're worried about getting embarrassed. The other reason people don't do together and don't grow in church is because of schedule. Just two handfuls of life. You don't have time. And I encourage you this fall to make some changes to where you can do together. Any one of these three things can cause you to be a loner. Okay? And being a loner means you're not going to be an overcomer. And it's not going to work for you. Will Anderson was not a loner. He wasn't a loner. Uh, I, I, I'm going to share a story. Uh, I, was, uh, I spent a lot of time on the Red River, and the Red River's not necessarily a good place to be, but I just grew up on the Red River, as dangerous as it is, and, and it's dangerous when it's up, and it's dangerous when it's down, and it's really dangerous when it's down, and it's even dangerous in between. <laughs> I'd been going up down the river, river hunting, and, and I, I decided to take the big boat, and I didn't hardly ever take the big boat on the Red River unless the water rose up, and I knew there was this big old huge island out in the middle of the river, and you had to make a decision to go left or right. And so, But I, I knew that. And right when I was fixing to pull in and where we were going to hunt, I was, I was all by myself, okay? I had some people with me, but I dropped them off to hunt on another sandbar down there, and I was going down here to hunt by myself. So I was loaning it, and I was all by myself. And I turned off that big, off that current, and I turned to go to the bank, and that big old boat just went, whoa, and stopped right out in the middle of the river. It was just about threw me into the steering console 
And I, and I turn the key off, and I'm like, boy, I have messed up now. The problem is the river had gone up to about 15 feet at Pecan Point. And so the river was rolling on both sides of me, but I was on a sandbar in the middle of the river. And I couldn't wade to uh, get to the bank. The current was too strong. Unless I were to put a life jacket on and swim downstream or something like that. But I needed to get my boat off of the sandbar. It's in the afternoon. And so uh, I called Ty. And him and his buddy were down river hunting. And I said, man, I'm stuck on a sandbar. Y'all try to come get me. We got to try to get this boat off the river. And it's kind of like quick sandling. You like to do doing that. Water's coming by and your boat's just kind of sinking down in the sand and getting wedged in there more and more and more. A new time. And there, there was no way I was going to get this thing out of there by myself. I'm picking on it, not even budging it. Can't even, can't even do anything. And so Ty and his buddy get over there, and they start trying to wade out to me, and the current's too strong, and they can't even get to me to help. I'm like, what in the world am I going to do? I was about seven miles upstream on, from New Boston at the exit 41 access. And there I saw way coming from Oklahoma over there, this guy in a boat, and he's coming by, flying down in that deep water over there, and and it just looks like my boat's sitting there, you know. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong because I'm in water, and it looks like you, because you do that all the time. You pull up sandbars, get out and hunt right there, whatever, duck hunt. And here we go, and I, I wave my hands at him, and praise the Lord, that man and his teenage son pulled right in there to me. I just said, I'm kind of in a bind right here. And he said, yes, sir, it looks that way, don't it? <laughs> and he saw, he saw my boy Ty and his buddy over here on the bank. And I said, do you have a minute to try to help me get off this sandbar? And I could tell he was in a hurry. And he said, yes, sir, we'll get it done. I said, can you see if you can get Boater, my boys, back over here and let's get this thing off? And sure, and he, he drives his boat around. He gets them over there. So now there's one, two, three four or five of us, surely five of us can get that boat off it, get it turned around there, get it. We can't budge the thing. The sand had already silted in around, so he ties his boat over uh, onto the, to the, he had a real nice boat, big old Ford horse, and he goes pulling on that boat, trying to drag it back in, and we're all pushing on it. Nothing. He goes across the river, he gets some, he had a saw with him, and he cut some big old willows about that long, about that big around, and about this long. And we tied onto that boat, and about an hour later, one inch at a time, we get that thing wedged back in the water. And me and that gentleman are good friends from to this day forward. That was about three years ago. I actually called him this week, and I said, you remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do some duck hunting together this year. And, and here's the deal. You're me. You're stuck. You're stuck. And you ain't going to get unstuck unless you go, hey, and you do it together. You say, well, that's not me. I, I, I'm in a small group. You know which one you are? You're the one going down the river. And if you're not careful, you're not going to reach out to people and connect with people and help them take some steps like you. I don't know which one you are, but I do know this. Is that Acts 2, 46, this is the strongest church has ever been, okay? They said every day they continue to meet together in the temple and church, and they broke bread in their homes they were studying the Word of God. You see that in Scripture. And they ate together, and they, they were glad and had sincere hearts. The next verse is said, and God added to their numbers daily. So it's time for us to move forward. I'm just telling you, sir, ma'am, young person, uh, teenagers, if you're not in one of the small groups, it's time. Okay? Some of you young adults, we got young adult small groups. Some of you older adults like me, we've got plenty of those going around here. But it's time, okay? You're burning daylight. That is your next step. We almost left this behind. 
I don't know how you feel. I want to encourage you. It's time to come together. It's time to come together. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. Thank you for the power of your word. And thank you how you do use together. It is amazing how you have just created us to be together. Every single thing we do is together. And so, Lord, I just pray that we, as we make decisions and steps this fall, that we would take that step to come together. And sir, ma'am, young person, maybe it's just time for you to say, okay, God, my schedule's what's kept me. Or, or, or I've been worried about being embarrassed. And, or whatever it is. And maybe the reason you're not going is because you haven't come together with God yet. If that's you, I just want to encourage you. Nothing else is going to work in your life until, like they were singing, until you come to Jesus. See, the only person that goes to hell is the person that chooses to go to hell because they choose to pay for their own sins. See, Jesus paid for your sins. Would you come to him? And if you give you, him your life, he forgives you of your sins and connects you into the body of Christ. He literally, the Bible says that your name will be written down in the Lamb's book of life. Snatched from hell to heaven. And I want to pray for you, and I'm the only one looking around. But if that's you today, and you know you need to get that settled with God, I just want you to proudly, me and you, I'm the only one looking, stick your hand straight up in the air, because I want to pray for you. Amen. Thank you. A lot of people. It's something, I can't do this for you. Thank you. I'm going to pray with you right now, and I'm going to give you a chance to do what I've done. Father, we're going to ask you to come and listen to these guys' prayers. Lord, they need you the same way I have you. And they are coming to you right now to give their life to you. And, and I just want you to pray with me right now and just say, Jesus, just between you and him and your heart, Jesus, you gave your life to me. You gave your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. I surrender my life to you. You can do whatever you want to with me. I'm coming together with you. And I ask you in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sins and fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.